You know, it's, I think, almost ironic, certainly interesting, that Christmas comes during the time of year that is the darkest, right? When the days are the shortest and there's the least amount of light, natural light in the world, the greatest light comes into the world. And, and that light shines in the darkness and the darkness does not overcome it. You know, Christmas, Christmas is that briefest of moments, that very brief and rare moment when all eyes focus on the light and darkness is forgotten. Right? No, not right. Uh, that's not true. We'd like it to be true. We wish it were true, but it's not. Um, The light of Christmas does shine in the darkness. And it is a beacon of hope. It's a promise of what will be, but it also reminds us. It shines on what is. There's a tension there. And Henry Wadsworth Longfellow captures that tension in in his very famous poem, I Heard the Bells on Christmas Day. Uh, We make that into a hymn, but we leave out a couple of the verses that kind of rob it of its meaning. Um, You know, in in 1861, uh, Longfellow's wife, Frances, or he called her Franny, I think, she was sealing envelopes with hot wax. You know how they used to do that? They took a candle and melted the wax and dripped it onto the the envelope to seal it. She was doing that, and somehow, somehow her dress caught on fire. And you know they didn't have flame retardant materials in those days. And her, you know, she caught on fire. And Longfellow rushed to help her to try to put out the flames. And he was himself very badly burned. You know that's why you see a picture of Longfellow. He always had this big beard. Um, that was to try to cover some of the scarring. He was very badly burned, but Francis, Francis died a couple days later. And, and Longfellow just spiraled into this really dark, dark depression, this deep depression. He, he apparently loved his wife very, very much and was deeply grieved. And then a, about a, like two de- years later, his son, who was 17 at the time, uh, ran away from home to join the Union Army. He wanted to, to fight in the, in the war, in the Civil War. And he went away and first he got very, very sick. He had uh, typhoid and he came home and uh, his dad nursed him back to health. And that, but then he went right back and he was severely wounded. He was shot through the shoulder. The bullet went all the way through and uh, you know, they didn't have the kind of medicine that we have nowadays, so he was months and months recovering. His father went to Washington and got him and brought him back home. And this left Longfellow in an even darker place than where he had been before. He was deeply depressed. And it was out of this, this deep shadow that this poem was born. I heard the bells on Christmas Day, their old familiar carols play. And wild and sweet the words repeat, peace on earth, goodwill to men. And thought how as the day had come, the belfries of all Christendom had rolled along the broken song of peace on earth, goodwill to men. Till ringing, singing on its way, revolved from night to day, a voice, a chime, a chant sublime of peace on earth, goodwill to men. Then from each black accursed mouth the cannon thundered in the south and with the sound the carol drowned of peace on earth, goodwill to men. It was as if an earthquake rent the hearthstones of a continent and made forlorn the households born of peace on earth, goodwill to men. And in despair, I bowed my head. There is no peace on earth, I said. For hate is strong and mocked the song of peace on earth, goodwill to men. Then pealed the bells, 
more loud and deep. God is not dead, nor doth he sleep. The wrong shall fail, the right prevail. With peace on earth, goodwill to men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness does not overcome it. You know, our friend the Grinch, if we dare to call him that, our friend the Grinch is the embodiment of all that is dark in this world. He, he, is, he is the thief who slips in under cover of night to rob the joy and steal the light. He, he gathers the presents, the, the stockings, the tree, and he stuffs them all back up the chimney. And into his sleigh he stuffs all the loot. It flies to the, the top of Mount Crumpet with his, his only intention to dump it. But before he can do that, before he can send that loot over the edge of that mountain, a pause. What is that sound? What is that sound that he hears drifting through the winter air? The wailing and, and moaning of broken-hearted who's? The shrill keening of bereaved children? No. Not a bit of it. Not a bit of it. As the Grinch strives to hear, familiar strains reach his ear. The, and wonder of wonders. There is no sorrow here. As on Christmas mornings past the who's, every man and woman... Girl and boy are singing songs of, of Christmas joy. And we cannot know, we don't know the song that they heard or whether it was melody or word, but something touched the heart of the Grinch that day. And it began to grow. You know, music has that kind of power, doesn't it? Music has that kind of power. It, music is a universal gift from God. It is a, a means of grace ordained by God and imbued with the power to transform even the hardest heart. And it would, I think, I think it would be hard to imagine Christmas without music. What would that be? Christmas without music. You know, music has been a part of, of the story of Christ's birth from the very, very beginning. From the very beginning. Because um, music has this power. It has the power to, to convey emotion in ways that words just cannot do. Words just can't communicate it. When Mary goes to visit her cousin Elizabeth, you remember the, the child in Elizabeth's womb leaps for joy. And Mary responds with this beautiful song that we call the Magnificat. My soul magnifies the Lord. My, my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has looked with favor on the lowliness of his servant. Surely from now on all generations will call me blessed. You know, it would be a good story if it ended right there on that mountain with the Grinch's heart expanded to three times. That would be a good story. But that's not the end of the story. That's not the end of the story at all. In fact, the greatest miracle is yet to come. The greatest miracle is, is not that the Grinch's heart grew three times but rather that having discovered the, this holiday crime, that the Who's, you know, the Who's would be well within their right to demand retribution, to demand revenge, to demand that, the, the, that Grinch be punished for what he had done. Um, in fact, prison might be too good for a creature who would rob children of their joy. I mean, what kind of a creature would do that? And, and no one, no one, I certainly wouldn't, but no one would blame 
the Who's, if they banished that old Grinch from their land to never return again. Right? I mean, it would seem a right and a good thing that the name Grinch would become an anathema that was spoken only in whispers by the citizens of Hoosville. But that's not what happens. That it, they, that's not what happens. You know, as terrible as the Grinch's behavior has been, as bad as he has been, um, the, the Who's are willing to leave the past in the past. They are willing to leave his past behaviors in the past right where they belong. They don't seek revenge. They don't ask for, they don't seek retribution. But instead, they, they invite this, formy, this furry former thief, that was hard to say, furry former thief, they invite him to dinner. They invite him to the feast. And it's like, for the Grinch, repentance ends in acceptance. When he turned away from who he was and turned towards the joy, that repentance led to acceptance. That's not always the case, but it was for him. A change of heart ended with a place at the table. Not only a place of, at the table, but the place of honor. He carved the roast beast. That's an honor. And I can't help but think that the relationship that you and I have with God is like that. It's like that, where God has provided a place at the table and sent out invitations to all people. Everyone's invited to the feast. Everyone. The brokenhearted and the whole, the sinner, the saint, the rich and the poor, the male, the female, and those who are neither, to dark-skinned and light, to all people everywhere, the invitation has gone out. We are all invited that invitation was sent out in the form of a little bitty baby. In the form of, of a baby who took on, who though he was, he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be grasped and held on to, but instead emptied himself and took on the form of a slave. And being born in human likeness, he came to dwell among us. An invitation. An invitation. For every and for all, there is a place. There is a place for you and there is a place for me at God's table. God knows your name. And God has engraved your name on your place card at God's table. There is a place for you. Don't ever doubt it. And here's, I think, the beauty of the thing. That for God, what happens in the past is in the past. The Bible says that, that God takes our sins, forgives them, and then throws those sins into the very deepest part of the ocean and puts up a no fishing sign. For God, the past remains in the past. Who you or I, who we might have been, who we once were, uh, that doesn't matter. That doesn't define us. That doesn't, who you were yesterday does not define who you are today. Who you were when you walked in the door of this sanctuary this morning does not define who you will be when you walk out. That's, uh, that's, an amazing thing. For those who choose the way of Christ, every single day, every day offers a chance for a new beginning, a do-over, a start fresh. Every single day. Every day gives birth to hope. There is no heart. 
that is so atrophied, that is so hard that God can't break it open. And it is, it is when you break open the heart, it's through the cracks. That's, that's how the light gets in. Only a heart that's been broken can be vulnerable, can be open enough to allow the light in. God will break even the hardest heart. There is no heart that is so small, so shriveled up that God cannot cause it to grow. Now, of course, it is one thing to be transformed. It's one thing to be transformed. It's quite another thing to be welcomed, to be embraced, to be welcomed into full community. It's, it's something very different to be invited to the feast, to be welcomed at the feast. You know, I had the experience that when I first became a Christian, you know, I, I did not grow up a Christian. I was an adult before I became a Christian. Um, and I became a Christian by reading the Bible. I, I, just, I had this little cabin out on Cypress Creek where I lived, and I didn't have a TV or a radio or anything, so I read the Bible. And I came to believe it, and I became, I, I became convinced that Jesus is Lord. And so I went to church, because what else? That's what Christians do, as far as I knew. You go to church. So I went to this church, and the pastor in that church would not speak to me. Literally. Would not speak to me. I tried to make an appointment to talk to him. He, he didn't have time. I, I would come out on Sunday after the worship service, and he'd be out there greeting people and shaking hands, and when I came, he would turn away. He, he just... He did not believe that I was sincere. And he thought, I, I don't know what he thought, because he's never ever, I still, you know, he's one of my colleagues, but we, he has never ever had that conversation <laughs> to tell me why he wouldn't talk to me. But he wasn't the only one. There were, I learned later that there were many people in the congregation who thought, what's this guy doing here? We know him. What's he doing here? So I take it very seriously that it's important that we trust the transformation that God can bring, that we don't judge others, that, that when, when someone says they have changed or when they come, that we accept them, that we bring them in just exactly as they are. Our job isn't to fix people. Our job isn't to, to change people. That's God's work. That's not our work. Our work is simply to love one another. It is simply to love and to welcome one another just exactly as we are. And just, you know, we are called to, to welcome others in the same way that the Who's welcomed the Grinch to their table. Um, you know, we are, as a people who have been forgiven, we have all been forgiven. And as a people who have been forgiven, we are called to forgive one another. What did Jesus say? Jesus said, love your enemies. Pray for those who, who oppress you. Do good to those who would harm you. If anyone strikes you on the right cheek, give them the left. If anyone asks for your, for your coat, give them your shirt too. If anyone forces you to go to a mile, go two miles. Our call is a call to love. We have been invited to the feast. There, we have a place at the table. We have been invited, and, and we are called to invite others. To invite others. And maybe that's really the meaning of Christmas. Every Christmas is an opportunity to welcome the Christ child anew. To welcome Jesus into our heart again, fresh and new. And every Christmas offers the opportunity for shriveled and underdeveloped hearts to grow. We sang this song this morning, Love came down at Christmas, love all lovely, love divine. Love was born at Christmas, stars and angels gave the sign. 
Love shall be our token. Love be yours and love be mine. Love of God and others. Love for plea and gift and sign. You know, as I look around this room this morning, and later on I'll, I'll go online and I'll check to see uh, who, who was with us this morning, who, who joined us online and who is here. And I look, at, at, but I can't help but wonder who's not here. Who's not here? And, and I'm not just talking about, you know, who do we know that's not here, who chose not to come to church today. I'm not just talking about them, them too. But who I'm really wondering is who hasn't received the invitation? Who haven't we invited to the feast? Who, who have we overlooked? Who have we forgotten? Um, and I'm not asking those questions because I want you to feel guilty, like, oh, I should have invited somebody, but I didn't. That's not the point at all. I don't want anybody to feel bad. It's Christmas, for goodness sakes. I want you to be, feel happy, feel full of joy. Um, that's not the point. The point is simply to point out that not all of the people that you know, not all the people in our community have been invited to the table. Not everyone has received the invitation to the feast. And, and until that happens, until every single person has received the invitation, then our work is not done. That's, that is our work as disciples of Jesus Christ. It is our work to go into the world and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey in all things while we remember that Christ is with us until the end of all things. That is our calling. The Christ who was born at Christmas on the night in which he gave himself up for us. We can read this in, in John chapter 17, that Jesus prayed. Jesus prayed that all of us, that all humans, all humanity, that we would all be one. That we would be one. And, and until that day comes, until the day comes when we are all one, united in love, in the love of Christ, and the love of one another, until that day comes, then there will always be room for our hearts to grow. There will always be work that is not done. It is my prayer that God will expand our hearts this Christmas season and give us eyes to see those whom we have overlooked and those whom we have forgotten. In Jesus' name, amen.